Stormwater is truly a latent potential in Australia. It has not been exploited like other first world countries have exploited it. It is also the unfortunate conveyance and storage network for organic and plastic pollution to get into our streams, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, and ultimately our bays, Moreton Bay, Port Phillip Bay. But it does provide a doorway of opportunity for improvement. This photograph was given to be me by my good friend Tim Silverwood from Take Three for the Sea. Tim is an avid surfer. This photograph shows three metric tons of plastic debris taken from the ocean and put into a convention hall. This is a powerful image. Well, it was powerful to me anyway. World science tells us that every 15 seconds, there is the equivalent to three metric tons of plastic debris entering our oceans from land-based sources. And most of this, if not all of it, is coming from our stormwater networks. <coughs> now, you would have seen earlier this week um, on the ABC News that there was a whale washed up in Thailand and it coughed up five plastic bags. When that whale died, they opened it up and inside was 80 plastic bags. This is not uncommon. There's more examples of this I could show you. I noticed um, there was also an incident in Warrnambool with plastic nurdles all over the beach. A lot of people think that plastic pollution is a problem in Asia and a problem in India, but not in Australia. I'm really sorry to break the bad news if you think that. This photograph here is from Admiralty Island, Cairns Harbour, Great Barrier Reef. And working with Heidi from Tangaroa Blue Foundation, we are collecting plastic pollution to a protocol and we are documenting the source based off the label. Most of the product on Australian shorelines is from Australian land-based sources. It is not international. According to the CSIRO, there is 1,500 kilograms of plastic waste entering Australian oceans every single hour. This piece of artwork here is 1,500 kilograms of plastic waste taken from Australian beaches. The same study tells us that on any given beach, they found from thousands to 40,000 pieces of plastic. And most of it is from Australian sources. And most of it, the build up, the intensity increases around urban areas. I took this photo at the, near the mouth of the Brisbane River, fishing there with my son. You can see the city cat here, a little man-made beach, and you can see the plastic just in the river wash. Looks pretty bad, hey? Let's zoom in a little closer. When I went walking up there, I got off the rocks, and I started to try and count how much plastic pollution was there. Have a close look at the picture. Manly Cove in Sydney. There's a cleanup group there that every time they snorkel and dive and walk the beach, they are picking up hundreds of plastic straws. So here's your five major ocean guys. This black square here is where the Great Pacific garbage patch is. And I'm going to show you a picture of a fish that was caught about here. It's a five-week-old rainbow runner, and inside it was 17 pieces of plastic, five weeks old, and it's nowhere near the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That was in 2008. It's now 2018. When plastic is in ambient seawater, the PCBs and the DDTs in the plastic adsorb. They form a film on the plastic. It is endocrine affecting substance. 
So it's going into the hormones of the fish, of the marine life that is swallowing it. Guess who eats the fish? So, I don't know about everyone here, but I have two children. Chase, my little boy, is eight, and Cherry, my girl, is 12. I don't want my kids eating plastic in their fish fingers. I'm sure you don't want yours to either, or your grandchildren. 50% of the world's oxygen comes from the ocean, 75% of the world's life is in the ocean, and 75% of beach rubbish is plastic. Stormwater has to be cleaned, and there is methods to do that. However, the assets have to be maintained. How big a disaster does it take before we do something about it? We're not just talking about water quality here, folks. We're talking about conveyance and quantity. Australia is still a relatively young country. So in Europe and in America, where they are older um, organisations or institutions, they have crumbling infrastructure and they have stormwater utilities dedicated So do we have to wait for this to happen before we do something about it? Now this is an American photo, and thankfully there was no kids in the school bus, it was on the way to pick them up. But I ask you the question, what are we prepared to invest into the future of our planet? I was seriously excited and encouraged when I heard this year in April The the federal government in Australia had announced $50 million of seed funding for an Australian space agency. Because I thought, if that's important to the federal government, how much more important should water be? So I ask you, in an age where we have the take up of solar and wind farms as rapidly advancing technology, we have Tesla, We have driverless cars coming online. We have drone delivery. We're getting into jetpacks and we're trying to do intergalactic travel. Where is all of that really cool stuff made? It's all made in a factory on planet Earth and every one of those technologies involves plastic. The thing is, is that plastic is here to stay. We have to manage it. And we've started doing a good job of banning plastic bags and using reusable drinking water bottles and coffee cups. But there's a lot more work to be done, folks. And the pollution running out of the large factories generally ends up as an EPA compliance. But in the main, the pollution is coming from the seriously urban areas, the plastic pollution. And that burden falls on local governments and they do not have the resource to ensure adequate compliance. So is there a solution? I think there is, and I would like to put that forward to you now. Before I... In the water world, we have three legs to the stool. One is potable water, the other is sewage, and the third one is stormwater. Right now, the stormwater leg is very, very wobbly. It's time that we started treating stormwater like we treat its cousins, potable and sewer. It needs to be run like a business. This is an opportunity for local governments to get revenue back like potable and sewer. So how do we do this? In Australia at the moment, we have a certain way of thinking about stormwater. So here's your average house with the driveway and the potable water comes in and everyone says, yep, I'm prepared to pay for that service. And the sewage goes out, yes, I'm also prepared to pay for that service. It's an essential service. And the stormwater that's on my property, it's on my property, yes, I'll look after that, I'll call that mine. But as soon as it goes away, That's a public asset. It's not mine. We have to change our thinking about stormwater 
to think about it the same way as we think about potable and sewer. We need system-based thinking about stormwater. And this is, we're not reinventing the wheel. This has already been done in other more developed economies in Australia. So what is a stormwater utility? It is an organisational entity within council that is wholly responsible for stormwater matters. It does nothing else. It has a sustainable funding method. It doesn't rely on grants. It doesn't rely, rely on episodic funding. Stormwater needs a paycheck, just like you and I need a paycheck. And just like potable water gets a paycheck, and so does sewer. For a utility to be successful, it has to be flexible. It has to take into account your specific <coughs> catchment characteristics. And there is quite a few examples in uh, France and Germany and the United States of how multiple councils have worked together to bring their costs down and increase their revenue and their ultimate benefit to the environment and the public. And most importantly, it credits and encourages and rewards good performance. So what is the stormwater meter? Well, the motto is, the more you pave, the more you pay. The stormwater meter, the most generalised effective stormwater meter is impervious area. So the average house, let's say it's 200 square metres of impervious area. When they set up a storm utility, they do GIS mapping of the catchment and pick what they call the equivalent rating unit of impervious area. We're not so worried about the mums and the dads in the households, drop them in one or two buckets, small, medium and large. Because the real polluters are the ones that are giving all the runoff. So when we get the ERU, we then go and look at the hotel. We're standing here today in the ridges. So this hotel could be 40 equivalent rating units of mum and dad down the road in the unit or in their standalone dwelling. Now, you must give credits for good performance. And what this does is this is incentivizing and driving low impact development. So people in the United States are now starting to design and park on a combination of permeable pavers and grass because they are lowering their impervious area. How good is that for the environment? So do you think that Bunnings can't afford to maintain this bioretention system with all those dead wetland plants in it? Do you think that McDonald's can't afford to maintain this bioretention system? The only reason these guys aren't doing it is because there is no compliance. There is no policeman. We have a parking fine policeman. I've personally experienced that. We need a stormwater policeman. So what does this cost? We have to be really, really careful when we're setting up stormwater utilities. But to give you a bit of an idea, for a $1 fee, you'll get like a Suzuki Swift, sort of a stormwater utility. For a $5 fee, you'd be driving around in like a Mazda CX-9 top-of-the-range model. How much revenue would this generate in Sydney? Well, you've got 4.7 million people. At $1 per month per ERU, you could generate $40 to $50 million annually. We could do a fair bit with that, but that's not effective enough. For $5 a month, you could generate approximately 200 to 250 million dollars annually. You can do a lot with that sort of money. Now, this list of countries on here is wealth per capita in US dollars. According to World Bank data 2017, the top 13 countries. And when Australia is number three on the list, I'm not going to let anybody tell me that we can't afford to do this as a society. When the US, who is after us, is already doing it widespread. France, who is 12th on the list, is doing it. And Germany, who is about number 16 on the list, they were doing it first. 
So we are amongst the most wealthiest wealth per capita in the world. So alone, we are a drop. But together, we are an ocean. And if we're going to be effective, we need to be an ocean with a message. And that message needs to be one that resonates with the people. Because until our message from the stormwater industry and from local government resonates with the people, the politicians won't act. When it does resonate, the politicians will act. And I believe that that message is plastic pollution. This photograph shows you the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Many of you here would have heard about it. It has just recently been remapped. It is now three times the size of France. Let me put that into an Australian context for you folks. The size of that garbage patch now is 1.6 million square kilometres. The state of Queensland in Australia is 1.8 million square kilometres. Have a look at the map of Queensland and just refresh on how big Queensland is as a landmass. So would you sacrifice one cup of coffee a month, $4.55 or $5, to keep Australia's beaches clean? Or would you sacrifice more to keep the plastic out of our food chain? So where do we go from here? We are setting up, as the stormwater industry, we are setting up a task force of eminent persons to lobby both state and federal government for funding support for local governments to investigate the possibilities and benefits of stormwater utilities for their catchment. And the mission is to stem plastic pollution entering aquatic ecosystems from land-based sources for their catchment. We have to take this on step by step, piece by piece. This will also lead to assisting with other water conveyance, quantity and quality compliance. You will start to get revenue that you can use to replace these billions of dollars of infrastructure that's in the ground that currently doesn't have a replacement budget. So what do I think about the future of stormwater? I think that if we can get behind this message and empower our politicians to act, the future of stormwater in Australia is going to be brighter. It's going to be greater. Thank you very much for your time. And if you want to support us, please reach out to me. My contact details are up there. Thank you.